let's begin with a prayer to the Holy Spirit and then we'll do our beloved prayer to the angels. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you will renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. Lord, by the light of the Holy Spirit, you have caught the hearts of your faithful in, in that same Spirit. Help us to relish what is right, and always rejoice in your consolation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this day be at my side, to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, this is what we hope to accomplish tonight. Uh, I hope to speak, we're going to begin speaking about creation at large, just creation in general. Then, I'm going to speak about creation and the angels, and like I said at Mass, at the time of the announcements, I said creation is a lot more than what meets the eye, right? We know that creation is not only what we see, but it's also what we don't see. So that's specifically the topic for the evening, creation and the angels, and then, towards the end, we'll speak about the evil angels, and then in that context, I'm going to say something about exorcisms, diabolical possession, you know, what that means, and also diabolical, uh, what we call obsession. Well, let's begin then with creation. In the Nicene Creed that we recite every Sunday, we say, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things, visible and invisible. Very good. You're so, you're so good. You don't need this class. You can go home now. <laughs> the expression heaven and earth means that all that exists, creation in its entirety, belongs to God. It also indicates the deep bond that exists between all of creation. So not only heaven and earth, but also earth and heaven are united. Obviously we know the earth indicates our world, what we can see, and heaven in the creed designates the place of spiritual creatures, the place where the saints are, the place where God dwells along with his angels. We want to focus today's conference on the existence of angels, of course, including the evil ones, but before we do that, we need to say something about creation in general. The first book of the Bible, whose name is? In its first chapter and verse, it states, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the by stating that at the very beginning, the Bible wants us to know that creation is part of God's plan. From the beginning, God also conceived the glory of the new creation in Christ. This is why on the mother of all liturgies, when is the mother of all liturgies? When does that take place? Can anyone say, and Sal, if he's here, he may not raise his hand. <laughs> when do we celebrate what we call the mother of all the liturgies, of all the masses? That is on? I hear Easter, but to be more precise, it's Easter Vigil. The night before Easter. So the first Easter Mass that we have, which is Easter Vigil, to which I hope all of you can come. And this is, by the way, a non-paid commercial about the Easter Vigil. The Easter Vigil begins the readings, and there are seven, but we don't do all seven, so I promise you, you'll be out in less than two hours, you know, I promise. And it has, we do four, but the, uh, the first reading, 
the first reading that we do, that we do that day, is always the reading from Genesis. And it's a beautiful liturgy, and it's called the mother of all liturgies, precisely because in that liturgy, we go through the entire salvation history, beginning with the very act of creation, then going with the Israelites into the desert, into Egypt, and then, you know, it, it, it's all like building up, you know, building up, building up, and it's really a beautiful liturgy, the mother of all litur liturgies. But that's why it begins with creation, and it ends, all obviously, with the gospel, when we read the gospel of the resurrection of Christ, which is the new creation that has begun with Christ. It's important for us to speak about creation because it concerns the very foundation of our life. Knowing that God created the heavens and the earth is meant to answer the questions that people of all times have asked. Namely, where do we come from? Where are we going? What is our origin? What is our end? In the last conference, if you recall, I addressed some of these questions and we came to the conclusion that we, human beings, were created to know and to love and to serve God in this life so as to partake of this glory one day in heaven. Today we do not want to speak about the visible world but about the invisible one. God has revealed himself as the one to whom everything belongs. Psalm 115, verses 15 to 16 states, and I quote, May you be blessed by the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. And then Psalm 124, chapter 124, verse 8 says, Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The first three chapters of Genesis tell us about the creation of the world that we see. It is meant to express the truths of creation. It is not meant to be a historical account of how the world came into being. This is why for us Catholics we know that there is no contradiction between the story of creation and the theory of evolution. Pope was in the news, you know, last fall, if you recall, because he said something about this as if so the Catholic Church has said it for the first time, but in fact, you know, we have been saying this for, for a while. But what's important is that the eternal God gave a beginning to all that exists outside of himself. God gave a beginning to everything. The world that we see and the world that we don't see, God alone is the only one that can create. He himself is the only one who is uncreated. You know, my four-year-old niece, who will be five soon, but, you know, kids philosophize about life, you know, often, right? And sometimes the questions they ask kind of shock you. My brother called me the other day and he says, guess what uh, Alyssa, you know, was asking today? And I said, well, what was she asking? And he said, well, he said, you know, mommy has, uh, you know, uh, his mother, you know, uh, I mean, her mother, so my, my sister-in-law was pregnant. She lost her baby, so please do pray for her. Yeah, but, you know, at the time, you know, she was. So, anyway, so she says, you know, mommy, you know, is expecting a baby, and where do I come from? So, you know, my brother says, well, you know, from your mom, and, and so also mom comes also from, you know, her mom, and, and so on and so forth. And then she says, what about God? Like, where does he come from? Who made God? So my brother said, ask your uncle. <laughs> and I said to my brother, the answer is very simple. Nobody made God. The principal proof for the existence of God lies in the fact that nothing happens unless something causes it to happen. Cookies don't disappear from the cookie jar, of course, unless we ate them. We know that an oak tree doesn't grow 
um, out of the ground unless a, an acorn was dropped, you know, there. The philosophers express this reality by saying every effect must have a cause. So even if we do trace the development of the physical universe back to the Big Bang or whatever we want to call that, millions or billions of years ago, whenever the scientists you know, say that it happened, we eventually come to the point where we have to ask, all right, but who started it all off? Somebody had to start things or there would be no universe. From nothing, nothing comes. Babies come from parents and flowers grow from seeds, but there has to be a starting point. My niece's point. There must be someone who wasn't made by anyone else. There must be someone who always existed. Someone who never had a beginning. There must be someone of limitless power and intelligence whose very nature it is to exist. And there is such a someone. And that someone is exactly he whom we call God. God is he who exists by his very nature. Remember when Moses saw the burning bush and he asked God for his name? And what did God respond? He said, I am. I am. Tell them that I am sent me to you. That's what he said. He is who is. And that's precisely what Yahweh means. Yahweh means I am who am. God is he who is. So the answer to the child who asks who made God is very simple. No one made God. He always was and always will be. We express this concept of God, this fact that He is the source of all being, above and beyond all else that exists, by saying that He is the Supreme Being. It follows that there can be but one God. To speak of two or more Supreme Beings would be a contradiction. The very word supreme means above all others. If there were two equally powerful gods side by side, then neither one of them would be supreme. Neither would have the infinite power by which God, which God by his very nature must have. The infinite power of one would cancel out the infinite power of the other. So each one would be limited because we know that there, that is not true, there is only but one God, and God is a spirit. You know, at times people speak of the devil, and I'll talk about the devil you know, later, but when they speak about the devil, they speak about the devil as if the devil had equal power to God. And we know that that's impossible. The devil is actually very weak. But, you know, many times we, we make him, you know, this like big, you know, humongous, you know, thing. And, and he does exist and he's real, we'll talk about that later. But he can never be compared to God or the power of God. Now, there are three classes of spiritual substances which we know about. And are you bored already? <laughs> are you following me so far? Good. All right. So three classes of spiritual substances which we know about. First of all, there is God himself, a spiritual substance, the infinitely perfect spirit. Then there are angels. And then finally, there are human souls. Our human souls are also of a spiritual nature. In this life, our soul is united with a physical body and is dependent upon the body for its activities. But this is not an absolute and permanent dependence. When this unit from the body, so when it separates from the body at death, the soul will still function and will continue to exist. It will still know and love even more freely than during its mortal life. Now the soul will continue to long for its body for the soul was made for the body, and it will long for the body, which the soul will receive again, 
when we all resurrect with our bodies. Now, thinking or speaking of a spirit is actually difficult for us, for we don't know, we're not pure spirits, right? We live, you know, in our bodies, and so it's difficult to imagine, you know, what a spirit is like, since to imagine means to picture, and when it comes to a spirit, there is nothing to picture. And so if we want to grasp for an idea of a spirit, perhaps we can think of what we would be like if our bodies suddenly melted away. We still would be conscious of our own identity and personality. We still would retain all the knowledge that we have, all the loved ones that we love. We still would be me, you know, I still would be me, but the body would be gone. Then we would be a spirit. Men and angels may be said to be endless, in so far as they will never die. But they did have a beginning and are subject to change. Only God is eternal in the absolute sense. Not only will he never die, but never was there a time when he did not exist. Time, by the way, you know, it's a category that we have to use. You know, God lives outside of time. He always will be as he always was, without change forever. All of creation was created to partake of his glory. God had no other reason for creating us than his love and goodness. As St. Thomas Aquinas poetically said once, and I quote, Creatures came into existence when the key of love opened his hand. Isn't that a beautiful image? Creatures came into existence when the key of love open his hand. Those creatures refer to those that we see and those that we don't see. So let's now shift in a little bit of gears and begin to introduce now the creation of angels. Sometimes, you know, we hear a dress designer or a pastry cook or a perfume manufacturer say that they have a new creation, right? Well, when they do so, they are using the word creation in a very loose way. No matter how fresh a new style of dress may be, you know, or a, a meal or, you know, anything, it began, you know, with something. Whether it's a fabric of some kind or food, you know, of some sort, no matter how delectable a dessert or how delightful a fragrance, you know, they began with some kind of ingredients. To create, in its proper sense, means to make out of nothing. Only God, then, who is infinite, can do that. Only He has the power to create. Accurately speaking, when God creates, He has no need of materials, or tools to work with. He simply wills it, and a thing begins to exist. Going back to Genesis 1, verse 3 and 6, God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and so it was. God creates freely out of nothing. He can also give spiritual life to sinners by creating a pure heart in them and bodily life to the dead through the resurrection. So if you are praying for someone or for someone's conversion, keep on praying. Don't give up. The God who can create out of nothing can also create in us a new heart. In a way, we can say that God's creation never stops. It never ends. 
God is constantly creating and recreating. All of us need a new heart, our heart and our spirit to be renewed, and that can only happen through and by the power of God. Not only does God create out of nothing, but God also does not abandon his creatures to themselves. He gives us our existence and at every moment upholds and sustains us in being. If God were to withdraw his sustaining will from any of his creatures, that very instant the creature would cease to exist. It would fall back into nothingness from which it came. The earliest works of God's creation, which are known to us, he hasn't necessarily told us everything, but the earliest works of God's creation, which we know about, are the angels. An angel is a spirit, that is, a being, with an intelligence and a will, but without a body, without any dependence at all upon matter. The human soul, as we said, is also a spirit, but the human soul will not be an angel, even during the time after death, when it is separated from the body, awaiting the resurrection. Every now and then at funerals, you know, people will say, you know, I have an angel, you know, in heaven. And I think people do it out of comfort, you know, to comfort the other. But in its proper sense, you know, an angel is a different being which is completely different from us. We have a spirit which is called a soul which lives in our bodies and so long as we are in our bodies, you know, our souls are in our bodies, but when we die, when our bodies die, our soul continues to exist, but it doesn't transform itself into an angel. So be careful with language. A human person composed of body and soul is not complete without the body, but an angel is a complete person without a body or need for a body. And an angel is also far superior to a human being. Even the most ingenious writer of science fiction could never do justice to the breathtaking beauty, the surpassing intelligence, and the tremendous power of angels. The existence of the spiritual, non-corporeal beings that sacred scripture calls angels is a truth of faith. Who are they? St. Augustine says that the word angel is the name of their office, not their nature. The word angel actually comes from the Greek, which means, anybody knows? Messenger. I'm kind of scared giving this talk because you may have heard that there is a Bible study group, you know, on campus that specializes this year on angiology and they're here taking notes and videotaping me just to make sure I say no heresy. Just kidding, but Joan, you know, is here, the leader, and thank you for that. And I know they've been having a lots of fun just talking about the angels this year. So the word angel means messenger. The matching Hebrew word has the same meaning. Angels are servants and messengers of God. Matthew 18.10 says, I quote, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in heaven always look upon the face of my heavenly Father. Psalm 103, verses 19 to 20 states, quote, The Lord has set his throne in heaven. His dominion extends over all. Bless the Lord, all you his angels, mighty in strength, acting at his behest, obedient to his 
command. So angels are servants and messengers of God. In the New Testament, we find that Christ is the center of the angelic world. They are His angels. As Matthew 25, 31 says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit upon His glorious throne. Then remember the temptations of Jesus in the desert? We hear also that angels came to minister to Him. Then remember the agony in the garden? In one of the Gospels, we also find that an angel came to console Him. They are His angels. After all, just like us, the angels were also created for Him. In Colossians 1, verses 15 to 16, we hear, He is the image of the invisible God. This is referring to Christ, not to the angels. The firstborn of all creation. For in Him, in Jesus, were created all things in heaven and on earth. The visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. End of quote. From this testimony, we gather not only that all of creation belongs to Jesus, but also that there are different levels of the angelic host. They are identified as archangels, principalities, powers, virtues, dominions, thrones, cherubim, and seraphim. It is quite possible that an archangel is as much above an angel in perfections as an angel is above men. But we don't know that for a fact. Actually, you know, we know very little about the angels, about their inner nature, or the degree of distinction between them. We don't even know how many of them there are, although the Bible indicates that their number is very great. Book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 10, says, Thousands of thousands minister to him and 10,000 times 100,000 stood before him. If you can figure out how many zeros you know there are on that, let me know, please. Are you still with me? Am I still with you? I need some water. Only three of the angels have been named for us. The ones that we call the Archangels. You know their names? Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, Raphael. Very good. Gabriel, which means hero of God. Michael, which means who is like God. And Raphael, which means God has healed. We'll get to that. We'll get to the devil soon. I know you're anxious to hear about the devil. <laughs> you're anxious to hear about the devil. But the good archangels, you know, let's say. The good, I don't know if the devil's an archangel. Honestly, I don't. He probably was, you know, one of the good guys, but turned bad. You know, but we're, we'll get that. So, Gabriel, hero of God. Michael, who is like God. And Raphael, God heals. With regard to the angels, it almost seems that God has been content to just give us a quick peek into the marvels and the magnificence that await us in the world beyond time and space. And this, let us remember, is not a world of fantasy and imagination that we are talking about. It is a world far more real than ours, more substantial, even that, than the sod that we tread. 
festival is a world to which we can go without benefit of interplanetary spaceships. You know, now going into space is, has become popular, right? And I go to bars, and you know, we're sending all these spaceships. Well, you know, we don't need them to, to, um, to get to heaven. It is a world to which we shall go, all of us, if we wish. Another characteristic of angels is that they serve as messengers of God's saving plan. I mean, the greatest of all messages is obviously given to the Blessed Mother by the Archangel Gabriel. Hebrews 1, verses 13 to 14 states, and if you were Protestants, you would all be sitting here with your Bibles, looking up every reference, but we are good Catholics, and I'm happy with it. <laughs> Hebrews 1, verses 13 to 14 states, But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent to serve? for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. And how beautiful. Sent to serve and for our salvation, for those of us also to inherit salvation. Throughout the history of salvation, we find the angels announcing God's salvation and serving God's divine plan we find angels, I mean, all over the Bible. Honestly, I didn't realize, I mean, how present they were until I started preparing for this talk, and it's like, there really are, I mean, all over the place. From Genesis, all the way to Revelation, the entire Bible is permeated by angels. So we see them, you know, in Genesis, remember they closed the earthly paradise, they protected, you know, Lot. They saved Hagar and her child. They held Abraham's hand to save Isaac. And if you're looking at me like, Father, what are you talking about? Then you need to read Genesis. <laughs> Later on, we find them leading the people of God, announcing births and callings and assisting the prophets. In the New Testament, the angel Gabriel announced not only the birth of Christ, but also the birth of John the Baptist. Of course, from the Incarnation to the Ascension, they are present. They sing glory to God in the highest that Jesus' birth. They protect Him in His infancy, serve Him in the desert, strengthen Him in His agony. We then find them proclaiming the good news of his resurrection. They are also present there. When God made the angels, he endowed them with intelligence and a will that was supremely free. They are personal and immortal creatures, surpassing in perfection all visible creatures. We know that the price of heaven is love for God. It is by making an act of love for God that a spirit, whether an angel or a human soul, fits itself for heaven. The love must be proved in the only way in which love for God can be proved, by a free and voluntary submission of the created will to God by what we commonly call an act of obedience or an act of loyalty. God made the angels with free wills so that they might be capable of making their act of love their choice for God. Only after they had done so would they see God face to face. Only then would they enter into that everlasting union with God which we call heaven. So far, so good? Still with me? Is this too complex? No, it's okay? All right. Good pace? Yeah? All right. So God has not made known to us the nature of the test to which the angels were put. Many theologians, 
speculate and think that God gave the angels a preview of Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of the human race, and commanded that they adore him. When they saw Jesus Christ in all of his humiliations, a babe in a manger, a criminal on a cross, According to this theory, some of the angels rebelled at the prospect that they would have to adore God in the guise of a man. Conscious of their own spiritual magnificence, their beauty and their dignity, they could not bring themselves to the act of submission. That adoration of Jesus Christ would demand of them, under the leadership of one of the most gifted of all the angels, Lucifer, which means bearer of light, just like Christopher means bearer of Christ, correct? Christopher, bearer of Christ, Lucifer, bearer of light, so light bearer. The sin of pride, which is also the sin of Adam and Eve, is the one that turned many of the angels away from God, and there rang through heaven the awful cry, we shall not serve. And thus hell began. Because hell is essentially the eternal separation of a spirit from Almighty God. They understood to a degree that Adam never did what the full consequence of their sin would be. With them there was no temptation in the sense in which we ordinarily understand the word. Theirs was what we would call a cold-blooded sin, by their deliberate and fully aware rejection of God, their wills fixed against God, fixed forever. For them there was no turning back. They did not want to turn back. Their choice was made, they knew it, and their choice was made for eternity. There burns in them an everlasting hatred for God and all his works. Scripture speaks of a sin of these angels. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 4 states, For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but condemned them to the chains of Tartarus, which in Greek mythology was uh, the, the place of infernal, you know, the infernal regions, and handed them over to be kept for judgment. So that's one illusion that we have in the scriptures. Another one is 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, which states, Whoever sins belongs to the devil, because the devil has sinned from the beginning. Indeed, the Son of God was revealed to destroy the works of the devil. We do not know how many angels sinned. From references made to them in the Bible, we infer that the fallen angels, or devils as commonly called, uh, are numerous. But it seems more probable that the great majority of the heavenly hosts remain faithful to God. They made their act of submission to God and are with God in heaven. The book of Revelation, chapter 12, verses 7 through 9 says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels battled against the dragon. The dragon and its angels fought back, but they did not prevail, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The huge dragon, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world, was thrown down to earth, and its angels were thrown down with it. End of quote. So far so good? Still with me? Okay. Frequently the devils, you see now, you see? I didn't have to hold it. We have a techie in the back taking care of it, you see? Frequently the devils are referred to as Satan. Satan is a Hebrew word which means adversary. Devil comes from the Greek word diabolos, in Spanish diablo, devil in English, which means slanderous or calumniator. He is the one 
who throws himself across God's plans. The devils are, of course, the adversary, the enemy of humankind. In their undying hatred for God, it is natural that they should hate God's creature, which is you know, all of us. When they sinned, the fallen angels lost none of their natural endowments. The devils possess a keenness of intellect and a power over nature such as is unknown to, to mere men. All their cleverness and power are directed now toward keeping from heaven the souls which are destined for that place. The efforts of the devils are ceaselessly directed towards leading humans into their own path of rebellion against God. In other words, we say that the devils tempt us to commit sin. But the devil can never force us to commit sin. He cannot get inside our human soul and manipulate it as he suits himself. He cannot destroy our freedom of choice. He cannot, so to speak, make us say yes when we really say no. But he is an adversary, healthily to be feared and respected. So is the devil real? That is where we're going after I get some more water. <laughs> Someone has said that even the worst sinner spends more time doing good things, things that are good and harmless, than doing things that are bad. In other words, there is some good even in the worst of all of us. That is what makes for some people so hard to understand the true nature of the devil. The fallen angels are pure spirits without bodies. They are completely immaterial. When they set their wills against God by their act of rebellion, they embrace evil, which is the rejection of God. They did so with their entire nature. A devil is 100% evil, 100% hatred, without even the faintest pinpoint of good anywhere in his being. Not the least of the horrors of hell will be the soul's constant and inescapable association with these spirits, whose unrelieved malice is a living and active force. In this life, we are uncomfortable and unhappy if we find ourselves even briefly in the company of a manifestly evil person. We hardly can bear to think what it would be like to be linked for all eternity with a living depravity whose completeness and driving force are immeasurably beyond those of the most corrupt human being. We can hardly bear to think of it, but we should do so, at least occasionally. Our great present danger from the devil is that we may let ourselves forget that he is a living and active force in the world. The devil would like us to think that he does not exist. The danger exists in letting ourselves be influenced by the intellectual pride of unbelievers, reading clever books or listening to smart people who patronizingly assume that the devil is a medieval superstition long since outgrown, we may unconsciously begin to think of the devil as a figure of speech, as an abstract symbol of evil without real existence. And that would be a fatal mistake Nothing would suit the devil better than to have us forget about him or ignore him. Above all, stop believing in him. After all, think about it. An enemy whose presence is unsuspected, who can strike from ambush, is a doubly dangerous enemy. 
devil's chances of victory increase in proportion to the blindness and the overconfidence of his victim. Remember that the devil is the father of lies, as the Lord says in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 44. You belong to your father, the devil, he's talking to uh, the Pharisees, uh, Jesus. You belong to your father, the devil, and you willingly carry out your father's desires. Then he goes on to say, he was a murderer from the beginning, and that does not stand in truth, because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks in character, because he's a liar, and the father of lies. If the devil's nature is so, we may wonder, why would God not do away with him? What God has made, right? Don't we wonder that sometimes? Like, okay, well, I'm so evil and exist, you know, why doesn't God just do away with it? Vanish, you know, vanish from, from the face of, uh, of heaven and earth. What God has made, we have to remember, he does not unmake. What God has given, he does not pay back. Think of our own sinfulness. Even when we have fallen, you know, deep down into mortal sin. Think about that. God doesn't suddenly just say, okay, well, you're done, that's it, bye-bye. Um, and, you know, think of how God doesn't take away our gift only because we have sinned. You know, what, when God gives, when God creates, He doesn't just uncreate. He doesn't take that back. Having given the angels intelligence and powers of a high order, God did not revoke those gifts, not even from the angels who sinned. If a mere human can tempt us to sin, a fellow worker can say, Come on, Joe, let's go out tonight and hit the hot spot and get drunk. If a neighbor, you know, can say, here it is, you know, I wish you'd try it, Mary. You know, you owe it to yourself. It's a new kind of drug. Then, you know, if another human being can do that, then certainly the devil can set before us temptations much more devious and much less obvious. That's precisely why we sin. I mean, Evil is never presented to us as such, because we are repulsed by evil. And we just said that we are repulsed by the company of somebody who does, you know, evil acts. And of course, you know, if we knew evil for what it is, you know, we would be repulsed by it. But temptation always comes as it came to Eve, with confusion, with half truth. You know, didn't God say not to eat? And then you begin to engage. You know, Eve begins to talk to the devil. Never do that. You lose. You got too much experience. You know, and then you will, well, you know. And then Eve says, well, no, he didn't really say this. You know, what he meant was, and that was it. She was doing it. So we know that the devil, you know, can also tempt us. But as I said before, he cannot make us sin. There is no power on earth or in hell that can make us sin. We still have our free will. It still remains with us to make the choice. And no one can force that choice upon us. We can say no to that fellow worker. We can say no to that neighbor. And the temptations that the devil may place in our path, however enticing they may be, we can reject them and do so firmly. There can be no sin unless and until our will freely turns from God and chooses a lesser good in preference to God. No one ever can truthfully say, I sinned because I couldn't help it. Even addicts have the responsibility to look for help since their freedom has been significantly curtailed. Now, not all temptations come from the devil, and you learn this in Catechism 101, right? So we said that temptations can come from three places. Help me out here. <coughs> <coughs> temptations can come from ourselves, they can come from our concupiscence, they can come from 
others we call it, I mean the world, you know, but it is others, and they can come from the devil. So all three, the world, the flesh, or the devil. Many temptations come from the world around us, even from our very friends and acquaintances, such as the ones mentioned above. And temptations can also come from deep-seated forces within us, which we call passions. Passions that often are rebellious and imperfectly controlled as a result of original sin. But from whatever source that temptation may come, we know that we can conquer them if we have the will to do so. For God does not command us to do the impossible. He would not demand of us unyielding love and absolute loyalty unless it were possible for us to give them. Now, should we be troubled or frightened by the fact that we are tempted? I ask you. Should we be troubled or frightened by the fact that we are tempted? Absolutely not! It is in fact by conquering temptation that we acquire merit before God. It is through defeated temptation that we grow in holiness. There will be little credit in being good, you know, if it were easy to be good, right? The great saints were not men and women who had no temptations. In most cases, they were men and women who had tremendous temptations and became saints by their victories. We shall not, of course, pretend or even think that we can win this battle on our own. We must rely on the help of God, for we know that our wills are weakened are weak. You know, without me, you can do nothing, Jesus says in John 15, 5. His help, His grace is always available to us in abundance if we want it, if we seek it, if we pray for it. Frequent confession, frequent communion, and prayer, particularly in time of temptation, will make us strong against anything that may come our way. You know, Lent is coming up, right? In less than a month, this year Easter is very early. So Lent begins very early. And not this Sunday, but next Sunday, and throughout the whole month of February, um, I'm going to publish, I just... Uh, drafted a very small, you know, letter, kind of invitation to the parish for us to come as our penance, our Lenten penance, instead of doing less, right? We always think of Lent, what am I going to give up, right? What am I going to give up? So we want to do, you know, less. I'm proposing let's do more. And what I'm proposing to the parish is let's come to daily Mass during Lent. For 40 days, let's offer that up to God as, as our sacrifice. Let's open up that space you know, for the Lord to come to daily Mass. Anyway, that's coming up. But that's one way where we get our strength in the Eucharist. Now, even with our prayer and with the sacraments, we have no right to expect God to do it all. So we also have to do our part. And part of that is avoiding unnecessary danger. Avoiding those circumstances, so far as we can, those people, places, and things that might entice us to sin. If we go looking for trouble, find it. If we play with fire, we're going to get burned. If we go looking for danger, then God's hands are tied. We have choked off grace at its very source. What did we call that before? And we still say that in some acts of contrition. Avoiding the near occasion of sin. There's a lot of wisdom in Avoiding the near occasion of sin. Now, on to what you were here for. Diabolical possession, 
versus obsession. It's like, Father, I have to carry you for 45 minutes to get to this point. Are you still awake? Good. Still with me? Is this boring you? Of course, you wouldn't dare to say otherwise, I hope. You just walk away, right? In the last few decades, much has been said about diabolical possessions and exorcisms. There is such a thing as being possessed by the devil. And I'm sure we all know or have heard of the movie, you know, The Exorcist, right? Uh, the, the one that came out, was it? 70s? 70s? Okay. And then, you know, there's other ones that have come out you know, since. Of course, you know, I was scared to death, you know, literally. You know, watching the exorcism of Emily Rose. It's a funny story. If you don't mind me telling you, I'll tell you the story. Because it, it's kind of a funny story. You know, so I was a St. John Newman's Proto Vicar, you know, at the time. The movie had just come out, I think it was 2004, or something like that. Father, this movie's great. He's got the Blessed Mother. And I mean, really, it's not scary. I'm like, I'm not watching any more scary films. I did that when I was my adolescent. No more. I can't sleep at night. No, 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 Father, don't worry about it, you know, really. So one day, you know, my, the other parochial vicar, you know, who was two of us in the house, only the two of us, and he was, I think, away on vacation, his day off, I forget. And I think it was a Sunday afternoon or something like that, I just said, well, you know, let me watch this movie, you know, they gave it to me, they say it's not scary. And, you know, once you begin, you know, of course, you know, you're like glued to the TV, you know, watching the movie. I couldn't sleep that night. <laughs> so anyway, but that's just me. You know, maybe, maybe you, you're not the same. Not that I'm scared of the devil, but I mean, it's just the way that it's made or whatever. I, anyway, I'm not into spooky, scary films anymore. I was, you know, when I was 16, not anymore. Anyway, uh, but there is such a thing as being possessed by the devil, really and literally. As we have pointed out previously, the full extent of the devil's power over the created universe including mankind, is unknown to us. We do know, however, that the devil can do nothing unless God permits it. Yet we also know that God, having set his creative plan in motion, does not normally take back any of the powers he originally bestowed, neither from us nor from the angels, including the bad ones. In any case, both the Bible and human history, as well as the continuing experience of the church, make it very plain that diabolical possession does happen. It is not common, but it does happen. Diabolical possession means that the devil enters into the body of a person and takes control of that person's physical activities, his speech, his movements, his actions. But what the devil cannot touch is the person's soul. The freedom of the human soul remains inviolate and not all the demons of hell can force it. During diabolical possession, a person loses control over his own physical actions to a stronger power, the power of the devil. What the body does is being done by the devil, not by the person himself or herself, but you know, there's such a thing as exorcism, and as I'll get to that. There is another form of influence you know, also, which is not necessarily possession, but it is an influence that the devil also may exert. This is called a diabolical obsession, sometimes also called diabolical oppression. In this case, the devil attacks a person from without rather than from within. He may pick the person up and dash him to the ground, cast him out of bed, torment him with hideous noises and other manifestations. St. John Vianney, the beloved um, Cure of ours, was one of those saints who suffered from this type of demonic influence. Also, I think Padre Pio also suffered from that. Both diabolical possession and diabolical obsession or oppression are rarely encountered nowadays, but they do happen. Now, recently, the Bishop of Brownsville, Texas, gave a talk to young adults on this topic. He said that while possessions are extremely rare, Demonic obsessions are more common, particularly by those who explore elements of the occult. 
you know, things like Ouija boards, tarot cards, you know, things like that. Be very careful. Never open you know, those doors. Once a person wanders into the occult, it welcomes demonic influence, Santeria, you know, all that stuff. However, we must always remember that God is much more powerful and can forgive us of our sin. The religious rite by which the devil is cast out of a person possessed or obsessed is called an exorcism. In the ritual of the church, there is a special ceremony for this purpose in which the mystical body of Christ calls upon the name and the power of Christ himself, the head of the church, to break the hold of Satan upon the person. The office of exorcist belongs to every priest, but it may not be officially exorcised except with a special permission from the bishop. And then, only after a careful investigation that has established that it really is a case of possession and not just mental illness. There is, of course, you know, nothing to prevent the priest from using his power of exorcism in a private, unofficial capacity. But to do an exorcism, like the ones you know, we see in the movies, the priest needs a delegation by the bishop, for the bishop is the chief exorcist of every diocese. Ordinarily, every diocese has an exorcist, at least one, whose name is not revealed, you know, of course, but you know, if there's a case of um, diabolical either influence or possession you know, something like that, you know, the church studies the case, and then the bishop delegates the exorcist, you know, the diocese to perform the rite. Now, a simple form of exorcism, believe it or not, is performed at every celebration of baptism. Have you been to a baptism lately? Pay close attention. The priest prays a prayer of exorcism. The priest says, Almighty and ever-living God, you sent your only Son into the world to cast out the power of Satan, spirit of evil, to rescue man from the kingdom of darkness and bring him into the splendor of your kingdom of light. We pray for this child. Set him or her free from original sin. Make him or her a temple of your glory and send your Holy Spirit to dwell with him or her. We ask this through Christ. That is called you know, a, a simple you know, form of exorcism that is done at every baptism. So all of us, in a way, we can say an exorcism was performed on all of us when we were baptized. The devil, we know, is at work, but we also know that God is at work. And God, if the devil works a lot, God works even more, and God works overtime. Of course, it seems much easier and much more pleasant to believe in the reality of only the good angels. And of course, we know that the power for their power for good is much greater than Satan's power for evil. The angels who remain faithful to God are now with him in heaven, engaged in the eternal love and adoration of God, which one day we pray will also be ours. Their will now is God's will. Like our Blessed Mother and the Saints, the angels are intensely interested in our welfare, in seeing us come safely to heaven. They pray for us, as do the saints. They use their angelic power to aid those who want and will accept their aid. That the angels do help us and that they exist is a matter of faith. If we do not believe that, then we do not believe the church, nor do we believe the Bible. That each of us as an individual guardian angel is not a matter of faith, but it is a commonly held belief of all Catholics. From antiquity, one of the fathers of the church, St. Basil, used to say, quote, Beside each believer stands an angel as protector and shepherd, leading
great mistake if we fail to honor and to invoke his earlier masterpieces, the angels, to protect both heaven and earth. That's all I have to <laughs> Thank you. close with our prayer. You may know that today, January 22nd, we commemorate the 42nd anniversary of the Roe v. Wade decision of the Supreme Court to legalize abortion in our country. In the last 42 years, over 51 million unborn children have been killed, so I ask you in their honor to uh, have one minute of silence. Together, let us pray the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in the hour of battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the other evil spirits, who prowl throughout the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good night and thank you so much for coming. God bless you.